Welcome NL Architects to the AA. Uh, Camille Klaas and Mark Linneman are here to join us to lecture about a sequence of projects over several years, about three years in formal practice. Um, NL Architects is an Amsterdam-based office with four principals, Peter Bannenberg, uh, Walter van Dijk, Camille Klaas and Mark Linneman, officially opened practice in 1997 but have shared a workspace since the early 90s. Um, they're all educated at Delft University and while living in Amsterdam, NL's commuting, quote, commuting office uh, started while carpooling, and I quote, uh, between these cities, Amsterdam and Delft. And in that sense, the principals would like to think of themselves as autodidactic, uh, pun intended. Uh, the recurrent fascination with mobility and tarmac could perhaps be traced back to being educated on the highway, as they say. Um, often projects uh, focus on ordinary aspects um, of everyday life, including the unappreciated, the unexpected potential of things that surround us. Uh, recent projects include the Embassy Store for Mandarina Duck, which opens in Paris, I believe, any day now. It is um, open. It is open. Uh, so go, to, go buy your bags at Mandarina Duck in, well, in Paris. You buy a lot because um, <laughs> yeah. you get a percentage of the profit of the first year. So yeah. if you come there, please buy. <laughs> uh, before, uh, more, more or not, not less recently, uh, in the summer, the Biennale show in Venice, uh, the, the Netherlands project. Um, also the WOS8 uh, heat transfer station, which they'll be showing, and various housing projects. Without any further ado, uh, join me please in welcoming Mark Linneman and Camille Klaas from NL Architects. Well, just to be uh, clear, I'm Mark Linneman. Camille is over there. And uh, we're becoming very popular in the Netherlands. This is our <laughs> company logo. <laughs> Unfortunately enough, um, of course, uh, as it goes with branding, you have to keep up with the times. And we have to change our logo now because uh, there's a new Euro uh, national sticker. Um, anyways, next slide. This is us. <laughs> That's me. That's Walter. Walter van Dijk. Pieter Bannenberg. And uh, Camille. Uh, this is um, the first time that we went public, basically. This is uh, early, uh, I think, uh, somewhere around 1996. We were asked to um, present uh, our vision on the city of Amsterdam for the year 2020. Vision 2020. Uh, and uh, it meant putting an idea about the city on a public billboard throughout the city. And um, that means basically communicating as uh, uh, art directors or uh, people that are in uh, the advertising business uh, do uh, architectural and urban design one-liners. This one's pretty clear. It's uh, about the... Uh, idea that the city center of Amsterdam, which is, of course, uh, incredibly beautiful, uh, is becoming a more and more uh, Disney-like theme park. Uh, and whether or not that is a good thing is one of the things that we wanted to put up for discussion. Next. This, uh, idea, this is a project that proposed to buy back the, uh, one of the most expensi expensive paintings that are on the free market, uh, uh, which is the sunflowers from Vincent van Gogh, and uh, to buy it back from the guy who owns it in Japan for a pro uh, an estimated 300 million uh, uh, guilders, which is at the moment uh, something like 125 to 150 million dollars um, that's uh, that would be an uh, sort of an urban design operation with uh, maximal impact and minimal footprint the idea is that 60% uh, of all the cutting flowers in the world travel through, uh, through Schiphol airport that's because uh, the airport is only uh, 
uh, biggest uh, flower auction in the world. And um, uh, we have this tourist attraction which is called the Keukenhof where people come just to watch the Dutch flowers. And of course it would be an incredibly chauvinistic move uh, uh, by from the airport uh, and would be very good for their public relations. And the most important thing is it would turn the airport uh, from a sort of a, a traffic node into a destination itself. Next. Uh, a more simple proposal that dealt with the same thing. Uh, people commute, uh, why not have supermarkets on board of the trains? Next. Um, this is a, a project we did about five years ago. Uh, park as cars. That's uh, about shopping and parking, and uh, it's very much about Amsterdam itself. As a city. Um, I think the generation right before us was uh, incredibly interested in uh, uh, the periphery uh, of cities, in uh, what was happening, sort of in the fringes where uh, real opportunities were. Um, where sort of freedoms uh, uh, were available and uh, for us uh, it seemed to be interesting to sort of see what <coughs> was happening to the city center as a sort of a result of these developments. Um, for us the car was an incredibly uh, uh, important uh, medium. Um, we were uh, commuting uh, ourselves daily uh, from Amsterdam to Delft and back and uh, got to talk in the car and so uh, tarmac became our uh, sort of nature um, uh, this seemed to be the case in in many places uh, as well um, to extremes that we uh, couldn't dream of uh, for instance the drive-in mortuary was a kind of macabre um, uh, reality that we hardly knew that would be possible um, but the car sort of had an incredible impact on urbanism and that seemed to be uh, a thing hardly realized at that point in time, five years ago in the Netherlands. And there's a generally very antagonistic attitude towards the car. Of course in Germany, uh, where this uh, magazine is uh, I think a weekly, uh, <laughs> uh, the situation is very different. Uh <laughs> uh, but uh, in the <laughs> In Amsterdam, um, sort of uh, this uh, sort of disnification of uh, of a historic center was uh, becoming uh, at a certain point in time very evident um, because uh, all, let's say, vital uh, economic uh, uh, elements or um, industries or whatever. Um, every sort of economic life, e every urban life was sort of replaced by uh, a kind of a Disney variant. So uh, at a certain point in time the uh, the biggest department store sort of threatened uh, being sort of an icon of uh, sort of inner, inner city life to sort of leave town and sort of go to uh, areas that were more uh, easily accessible by car. Uh, suddenly uh, the nation was uh, w sort of woke up this is uh, Amsterdam, um, sort of the first start in about 1400. For us it would be interesting to sort of really uh, look at the most uh, controversial uh, part of, uh, of town. This is what it looks like. Uh, nothing is actually higher than uh, uh, 30 meters. Except this one, of course, Dutch National Bank. Uh, at that moment, there was an incredible sort of hate uh, against uh, automobility, um, uh, sort of uh, fault like we have at the moment uh, in <laughs> the U.S. was uh, going on. Um, not many people showed up in the vote, but uh, the result was that uh, the car had to be banned from the inner city, and um, we thought that it was an incredible, uh, sort of incredibly negative uh, position. And what we hope to do is. Uh, create sort of a different attitude uh, towards uh, automobility, make it, as we thought it was, uh, a more fundamental part of uh, daily life. Um, 
even for let's say the politicians to think about and what you see here is a proposal uh, on one of the main um, uh, squares to uh, have a paid parking situation so we'll, you will receive receive one pound every hour of course parking could be really attractive um, normally the obligatory uh, uh, con continuous and uh, uh, all the time s uh, similar uh, parking floors you will never be able to find or uh, trace back uh, your car uh, I think Elvis made uh, even a song about it um, so what we thought th the first thing we should do is sort of try and uh, try to create a certain um, spatial differentiation so that it could be possible to find uh, your car again um, so the whole attitude was uh, about sort of uh, creating a kind of uh, understandable uh, sujet uh, proposal. Uh, then we thought, well, maybe uh, parking in itself is not not really interesting. So uh, it's all, uh, let's say, meant as a, a fertilizer or catalyst of uh, economic uh, life. So this was one of the first sketches. We have to sort of merge uh, parking in a more uh, integrated way with uh, um, other built stuff. There's a number of proposals of how um, other programs could uh, sort of directly uh, relate or be part of uh, a parking garage. So a parking garage would not be just a parking garage anymore. Um, th this was uh, in a way also an attitude that we found at that point in time uh, very apparent. Um, although the palace is a kind of uh, popular building, the sort of a, a total hysteria went actually into sort of recreating almost uh, this kind of small scale, uh, uh, really old school <laughs> historic uh, fabric. Uh, there was a sort of real fear for uh, large-scale development and for us this was kind of proof that actually sometimes large-scale elements uh, could really enrich the city um, this for us uh, this is a kind of an illegal map of Amsterdam it contains in black uh, everything that's monument <coughs> of course that's changing every day so there's much more black uh, since uh, <laughs> this map was drawn up. Um, but for us, <laughs> it was the map of, uh, let's say, uh, possibilities. The problem of, the, of this map is that it's also the map of possibilities for developers. So that meant that uh, at the time that we were given this map, uh, I, that was uh, you know, off the record. We were not to publicize it because it would be used for speculation because specula speculation is possible anywhere where there is no black on the map. <laughs> so what we <laughs> decided to do is sort of uh, uh, see uh, which parts of the city are not actually uh, historic and which parts uh, are not. So we thought maybe the white parts uh, could be open for development. Um, what you see here is sort of a very direct uh, extrusion um, of everything white uh, in a certain area. And th this is uh, the, the sort of the, the central uh, open air shopping mall, uh, and then uh, extruded until the uh, the height the height of 80 meters. Uh, so the main church can still be the highest point. This is another proposal um, to sort of transplant sort of a density uh, figure uh, defined by the 40 three uh, degrees angle um, that's considered very uh, 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 popular uh, in an area uh, called the Jordaan uh, w where the let's say square meter prices per uh, for every house are uh, highest uh, so we thought if we transplant uh, this sort of density uh, figure to an area where uh, uh, close by uh, the canals the distance is so much uh, bigger that we could, could also in the same proportion but because of the larger width of the canal um, create much higher buildings 
this is a more of a liposuction uh, model in which uh, the flat uh, areas are actually uh, existing monuments. Um, the rest that you see is uh, the envelopes that um, you can still uh, build in, uh, and it's uh, uh, well, many, many square meters less uh, according to uh, sort of a hygiene rule from the 1950s. Uh, so <coughs> the most popular area has a density that was, um, has a density of built mass that is not uh, allowed according to this rule. So This is the, the actual site in black, uh, again, the monument. We consider the, the in a way, kind of frustrating. Um, the dimensions that are left are not easily uh, handled. So we sort of opened the law book and, um, in a way, uh, found a remarkable uh, possibility. And, uh, of course, monuments you cannot demolish, but uh, brick by brick. <laughs> stone by stone, no? <laughs> you, can, you can take them apart and uh, rebuild them somewhere else. Uh, so that means that uh, in areas uh, where you want to actually uh, do something large scale, you probably can get rid of uh, some of the monuments and uh, create a sort of at least for a little bit a sort of a tabula rasa situation. And at the same time, it means that you can have a densification of historic buildings uh, elsewhere. So we thought maybe in some new towns they needed some historic buildings. <laughs> With <laughs> this uh, uh, law piece, we can uh, <laughs> we have the possibility to uh, to do that. Oh, actually, I'm going a little bit fast. So um, what we thought was that the, the, sort of the single parking lot was, uh, let's say, the catalyst of urban life. That was the hypothesis. And uh, we found out that if you tilt it 6%, that's the, sort of the, the maximum uh, slant th in which you can do still uh, perpendicular parking. Um, if we s would sort of extrude uh, this system, then uh, under this 6% uh, percent slope, you could uh, imagine uh, uh, any kind of uh, program. So um, if you would uh, extrude it, uh, still this virtual ceiling that we have in Amsterdam of 30 meters, this resulted in a, a building 500 meters long. And uh, for us, it was more, more interesting to uh, do, uh, actually, uh, to, to do a mirror operation so that this uh, tympanum uh, would uh, come about. Uh, because if you use, instead of a one-way traffic si uh, situation, a two-way traffic situation, the building in the end would become four times more interesting. Um, maybe you can think about this uh, at home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one-way traffic is always uh, sort of more popular in parking garages for uh, logistic reasons, but uh, we one of the kind of glamour and more, uh, let's say, street-like uh, situations. So for us, uh, two-way was the way to go. And by making it a little wider than traditional sort of narrow, uh, sort of cramped uh, parking garages, um, a two-way system was uh, actually logistically also imaginable. And it would work. So the building becomes like a contortionist. Uh, there's a story about the daddy of this, uh, of Jack, who was a contortionist as well, and <laughs> he was actually uh, buried in a box like uh, these dimensions. This is how it in the end sort of sits in the side. Um, the whole building is actually kind of a collision with the, the existing uh, fabric. If you unfold it again, you get this kind of hoovering clouds because it sort of intersects with itself at some point. 
it seemed to be a new topology. It's already part of standard works, as you could see. It was actually a pre-Photoshop uh, manipulation of <laughs> data. Uh, what you see here is uh, the 19,000 square meters of new uh, street level. Uh, at the same time, it's a roof. We found that according to uh, the Oxford Dictionary, uh, uh, asphalt, which is uh, tarmac at the same time, uh, is uh, a sticky black material that is uh, used for making roofs watertight, but mixed with uh, gravel or crushed rock, um, it's used for making roads. So already in the definition, um, the combination of infrastructure and uh, and building is uh, apparent. <coughs> Amsterdam is built on piles. It means that um, if you want to do a building, you have to uh, make piles that go to the carrying layer of sand uh, that is about 16 meters under the surface. Um, if you build it right on top of uh, the actual ground level, um, which would be an interesting experiment, the building will slowly uh, sink. So what we did is sort of just plainly extend uh, the piles to our new uh, ground level. So it sort of meets the slanted surface that we, that is our uh, roof road. Um, here, some more heavy duty uh, construction was necessary. Uh, so as soon as the building sort of goes over itself, um, we use uh, very large girders on two points of support. Uh, not anymore, the human scale uh, seemed to be uh, dominant, which was an incredible relief, but uh, turning circles of uh, cars uh, could actually make architecture. This is how the building, sort of the actual garage where there is a roof as well as a <coughs> barcode of columns. So everybody always sort of seemed to think that it's a garage for about 10,000 uh, cars, but actually uh, I have to disappoint everybody because it's only for 400. <laughs> And uh, sort of the, these thicknesses uh, could be used for, let's say, housing or uh, uh, shopping mall, hotel, congress facilities, whatever uh, urban sort of stuff that you need. The building is a logo. If you start to slice it, uh, some of the, let's say, office spaces or apartments uh, become visible. This is a section at uh, 22.5 meters, I think. <coughs> In the back you actually see the famous Berlage building, the Burrs from Berlage. This next project is uh, the same principle supplied to uh, a situation where we have an actual client. So the other one was quite uh, uh, quite a polemical <coughs> project, and this one uh, actually uh, will uh, show that uh, these principles are usable in a in an everyday situation. Um, yeah, what you see here is a very large uh, building block in uh, sort of a generic uh, sort of uh, area in Amsterdam, which is a 2040 belt. Um, the issue was how can you resolve parking in a nice way? So, so somehow, uh, three years later, uh, no, four years later, the local government actually uh, came to us because they sort of got interested in, uh, let's say, not negative, but 
positive ways to uh, think about parking in the city. And um, I think in this uh, sort of third way, uh, new uh, economics uh, uh, system, suddenly, uh, actually since last month, uh, the whole sort of negative approach ab uh, about uh, mobility that um, the government laid out, sort of uh, an approach to sort of get rid of it and uh, sort of uh, get people only uh, to use public transport, it, it seemed to be failing completely. And now uh, a completely new approach uh, is possible. And I think since last month, uh, the Netherlands can sort of uh, start rethinking uh, all these issues, uh, not anymore uh, in a subversive uh, way as we uh, started out. So that probably means for our office that we have to uh, get into completely new stuff. Um, but it becomes uh, sort of the way to go, the way to think. And uh, this is it. It's uh, actually three buildings uh, sitting on top of each other, sort of cul-de-sac situation. Um, I don't know if it's completely clear. That it was it the 2040 belt? Is that understandable? No, probably not. But it's uh, in uh, around 19 between 1920 and 1940. Uh, most uh, uh, there was uh, the crisis, except again uh, for in the Netherlands, and a lot of uh, new s um, city layouts were made to existing cities, and uh, this is one of these areas where this where now, uh, of course, parking is a problem. And um, the suggestion uh, was to uh, only take uh, sort of uh, little areas of the existing blocks uh, away um, and sort of put kind of these uh, sort of electronic parking uh, stacking situations, uh, sort of try to install these. But we thought of a more uh, fundamental uh, approach. There's actually a building in Edinburgh, uh, oh, uh, sorry, in Birmingham, uh, I think. And uh, so we thought if you sort of move these, these, these geological layers uh, further apart, a uh, program could be uh, fitted in. And uh, in a way, that's what we did. So we have three slanted beams um, that could be, um, because one of the things in the Netherlands at the moment that is very popular is uh, diversity, uh, which is maybe a thing that's extremely uh, annoying, but it's very popular. So we thought, if we if you do this, uh, one of the ways in which, uh, let's say, the new uh, area, it's called Eiburg for 18,000 houses, is being made, is that every building block at least needs uh, four different architects. Um, I don't know what it's good for, but uh, sort of abstraction and uh, um, sort of bigness or large-scale uh, developments are still uh, doomed. And uh, people wanted sort of every 10 meters to, uh, to for something else to happen. So in a way, every door handle needs to be different from any other door handle. Um, in a way, this could be <laughs> uh, sort of a way to establish coherence. Um, but by uh, giving these uh, out to different architects, um, still create a kind of uh, differentiation. This differentiation could as well be thought of as uh, using different programs. So um, in this building block dimension, which is actually uh, really nice, it's 200 by 50 meters, um, very spacious. Um, you could uh, do all kinds of uh, sort of combinations of, of these elements and still uh, create uh, sort of a, a singular attractive uh, object. I think the misconception in the Netherlands about this diversity is that it equal uh, that it uh, that urban life is diverse, but uh, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, urbanists try to make diversity, and of course that's complete nonsense because every single uh, client or uh, so person or institution or company that uh, wants to do something wants to do o one thing only, and. Uh, this is a sort of a, this this approach uh, this approach to diversity is completely embedded in Dutch culture at the moment and is uh, you know one big mistake. Our office in the back. 
Um, this is what perspective can do for you, for even very sort of long uh, buildings in uh, certain ur urban conditions can sort of end up as almost anthroposophic uh, <laughs> configurations. This is an uh, old project, uh, again, uh, from 1996, 1997. This is a, a European competition that we won in uh, near the city of The Hague. Um, in the Netherlands, there is a big reconfiguration of the landscape going on, which is called the Venex operation, and it deals with the fact that people are becoming more rich uh, and uh, do not want to live with eight people in one house. Um, Nowadays, uh, the whole uh, city is gearing towards living in, uh, you know, uh, or the whole country is trying to live a, uh, trying to live a dream of living in a house on the ground with a garden, uh, two people, two uh, kids, two dogs, two cars, two jobs. Um, more or less, uh, this is what. Uh, the market wants, so this is what we're building, because in the Netherlands uh, the Phoenix operation was a state-run operation, uh, or at least a state-instigated inst operation, and uh, now a lot of the uh, former open land is becoming suburb. Uh, actually this plays a part in many of our uh, uh, recent, of the project that we'll be showing, so this is why I'm telling about it in a little bit more detail. This project is for, uh, this was a, uh, a location uh, near, right here. This is The Hague, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Utrecht. This was the Green Heart. Um, there were to be built 8,000 uh, dwellings here, all ground related. Uh, and 120 of them, uh, so again, this is the... You see, this is the, the site here. That's the site, that one, Wateringen. Um, uh, and 120 of them got the uh, label experimental. This was handed out to the commission, and young architects like ourselves were allowed to do uh, whatever they wanted there. Um, now the material that the uh, Urban gave out was so uh, seductive that that year uh, uh, the largest. Uh, amount of people that actually signed in for Europe and was in The Hague. So um, there was a sort of a super large competition. It was mainly because uh, the material they sort of uh, sent us a brief was so uh, convincingly beautiful that everybody wanted to sort of be part of that beauty. There was mainly one image that uh, convinced everybody. Next slide. Uh, and I think it was an aerial photo. Uh, I don't know if we have it in, but it was an aerial uh, uh, photograph of this area, which is a uh, completely artificial landscape, uh, all made of glass houses, it lights up the sky at night, it's visible from the moon. Uh, and uh, so this is the entire location. It, it was co to be completely uh, cleared off. Uh, again, a tabula rasa situation. Yeah, that was the sort of the, the sort of the real shocker. The the urban side um, was here. Um, 120 dwellings needed to be uh, built there, but at the same time uh, so the, the attraction for everybody uh, was going to be uh, eroded or erased or white out. And, um, what this was not stated in the brief, in the first brief. So we uh, s uh, found out that um, this incredible attractive uh, area was going to be uh, changing in a kind of completely generic uh, everyday uh, suburb. When we, we found it. this out, we wanted to prove that uh, the two things uh, could coexist. Um, uh, so basically that meant that um, uh, we had to uh, accommodate all programs that were already there and 8,000 dwellings. And uh, uh, that meant that we had to introduce big buildings again in the Netherlands. And this is something that is uh, totally unpopular. Um, no. Well, one of the things that we did not know at the time was also that, that the, the mechanism that drives this uh, uh, sort of uh, operation is, uh, of course, a purely financial one. Um, 
the, the de developers, they buy the land wholesale and they sell it in little parcels. Uh, when we uh, came up with this uh, counter proposal, which of course is completely politically correct, uh, we were meddling with this mechanism and uh, of course our project was killed off. Uh, the hypothesis was in a way that uh, uh, all new stuff uh, could completely coexist what was already there. Mm -hmm. um, it could coexist. And um, now we try to prove that in the following uh, project. This is the site, the actual European site. But what it does show is an incredible diversity of, uh, of, uh, of the. Uh, of the so this is the actually uh, this is the site that, that we were given out to put up 120 dwellings. Of course, it's big enough uh, to put it in the same density uh, all ground related dwellings as happens anywhere else on the on the this big uh, location for these 8,000 dwellings. Uh, but what you see here, there's a farm here that's actually operational. There's a there are sports uh, 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 so sport facilities here. Tennis big fields. white cucumbers. This this uh, this uh, is a glass house that's operational, but the big white cucumbers are already in the gate to the shadow of planology that's falling over this area, because it's uh, much less uh, f uh, uh, financial resources intensive uh, operation. It's just basically storage. Here's uh, a garden uh, shed. Next, our uh, garden steads. But the landscape on the south side of location is completely empty. It's, uh, you have to imagine that this was going to be uh, erased for any uh, suburb. We thought, no. Beautiful Go. farms. And the glass houses that create this really weird sort of a st almost Star Trek-like condition at night. Or no, what should I say, E.T.? Close encounter. So what we hope to do is sort of uh, insert a number of uh, big buildings that actually could combine some of the uh, more popular uh, uh, suburban uh, uh, market wishes. Of course, it's a very difficult, difficult uh, problem, but we uh, try it by sort of extending uh, uh, houses with f uh, four views uh, with sort of a hanging garden in the air. The basic sort of principle of bring the so car very close to your front door. All 8,000 dwellings we redesigned. So we did all blocks, and now we show a few of the uh, proposals. Mm. Every time what you see here is the area that normally would have been uh, completely built and now is available for what's already there or for new developments. So let's say the little. Uh, Rectangle here uh, is uh, a place for uh, 60 uh, dwellings. Um, the rest could be used for anything else. So we completely uh, stick to the, the the sort of average uh, density of 35 uh, houses a square hectare, which is 100 by 100 uh, meters. Um, but sort of by reconfiguring them in uh, compact uh, buildings. It seemed that a lot of land or uh, state available for non-housing uh, elements. Our biggest frustration was, of course, to find out that uh, all the other programs that were there were bought out with uh, 150 million uh, guilders uh, that were not used to actually produce uh, good buildings, but just were uh, intended to, uh, er you know, to make a clean slate. Uh, the, the whole uh, operation of uh, sort of replacing these greenhouses that were uh, completely uh, uh, sort of economically viable in that area, but sort of this 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 uh, incredible operation of moving them out elsewhere um, would result for every house uh, in a sort of uh, an extra cost of one third. Um, so ground cost um, amounted up to. Uh, one third of building cost. Uh, so we, what we figured out is that if you uh, not replace uh, the existing, um, you could sort of do other stuff with that one third. 
of your building costs. You could make more expensive uh, apartments. But this is the kind of combinations that you can find. A complete mix, a complete pixelation of um, different elements that could build up uh, uh, something unknown yet, uh, something very dreamy, a um, mix of very urban elements and very rural, uh, agricultural elements at the same time. Sort of weird beauty in the view. You see the glass houses with the, the high rises popping up and each one different. Uh, as, as long as you're on sort of ground level, they seem to be uh, hardly uh, visible because of the uh, proximity of the the walls of these gr uh, glass houses, but if you sort of rise, um, this <coughs> actually this was a an OMA uh, proposal that was for uh, the city hall of the Hague. <laughs> we thought uh, maybe we could sort of reuse it and flip it over, so it has a minimal. Uh, a footprint and uh, more penthouses than. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, this is part of the political statement, and uh, we were not particularly liked because of uh, saying this out loud and also uh, doing this in a visual, fairly attractive way. Because we also had to produce a building that uh, actually fit on the side and that would prove our uh, hypothesis in, uh, in a, in a, on a one-to-one -one scale. That uh, it's not only, um, uh, you know, sort of a political uh, statement, but also, uh, you know, that as a designer you can make this. So the idea was that um, uh, urbanism could be really uh, like Photoshop and that the existing could be uh, merged with uh, new stuff uh, in a very similar way. Um, so we have to, sh to change trace, I think. Yes. So uh, most things that you will see uh, tonight is uh, the are sort of really uh, hypothetical and uh, or virtual or uh, paper or uh, controversial or uh, not built, which is of course very boring. Uh, we will get to uh, build stuff. Uh, we only did one building uh, uh, a little bit later. So please. Uh, Bear with us. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the one that uh, the, the actual site project for the uh, um, for this uh, Europan scheme and um, will be brief because uh, again, this was this. I think this was the image that, that people were so much attracted to that uh, that so many people sent in. This was the site. Uh, one plot uh, on the site was actually empty. Next, it was this site. So we made a building that exactly fit on this uh, uh, little piece of grass. Uh, this is the building. Uh, we call it hall because there's a big hall in the middle. It's, it's uh, and that comes from the premise that we decided that if the market uh, uh, dictates that people uh, want ground-related dwellings, we'll give every house in this big building all the properties of ground-related dwellings. Very simple. So you can park in front of your door. That's why you see the ramps in the back. And so each house has its own uh, garden, be it a roof garden or uh, you know, an uh, indoor uh, uh, winter garden. Next. There will be a, a piece of land. So this is kind of a sort of Corbusian uh, uh, construction. The ramps. Here is the, again the site layout. This is the plot in square meter, the entire given plot in square meters and the amount of dwellings that are to fit on it. Yeah, sort of bringing up the the, the, the gardens uh, until the which layer, six layer or something? Um, mm. 
uh, created this sort of intense uh, void in the in the center of the building. Have plans, of course. Everybody, a parking space in front of there. This is parking on the fifth layer and on the first level. Sort of a. But the facade that looked uh, in the previous image like a, almost uh, very much like a Herzog and de Moron building, of course, had to be uh, cuddly. So we th uh, thought we'd fill it up with feathers since we have uh, uh, double glazing. And uh, uh, that way we could actually produce the image that Mies already drew in 1920 uh, by sorting the colors of down. Next. Actually. You get this sort of uh, instant picturesque uh, situation because you don't you don't take away the the rural or agri uh, agricultural, but you just insert the new into it. Um. This is uh, Friedrichstraße at the Hague. <coughs> and at night, between the glass houses, the mother ship has landed. All right. This is uh, more or less the one of the one of the outcomes of this project. Of course, uh, we won the competition. We got first prize, but uh, until now we forgot to mention that there was another first prize. Of course, it was all ground-related dwellings, 120, and the project has was built was finished already two years ago. Uh, but uh, we got uh, a commission to. Uh, to look at an area here, which is called the Morgenstond, in a, in a post-war expansion of the city of The Hague, uh, this actually this area, where for uh, where now 20,000 dwellings are uh, in need of uh, desperate need of renovation because all of the uh, more well-to-do people that live in that area are now moving to this area, which is the site of the for project that we just showed. Um, uh, so there's some sort of ghettofication uh, going on, uh, sort of. Uh yeah, the, the idea is that the sort of the uh, all the let's say uh, uh, middle class people will move to the suburb, and uh, the the, sort of the fear of uh, um, sort of the what is the housing corporation? The, the corporations that own the. Um, the, 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 the site that we were uh, to look into um, is that it turns out to be a ghetto after 5, 10, 15 years. But the housing corporation, of course, see this coming a mile away. So they uh, decided, you know, we have to do something about it. And some extensive studies were done in, into the specific qualities uh, uh, of this area by a, uh, an architectural office or an urban design office, uh, Loof and Van Sticht. And this is the situation as it was built just after the war. What is very typical about this situation is that there are very fairly compact buildings, although nowadays they don't suffice, any, uh, this, uh, suffice anymore. But there was a shortage of building material after the war. And, uh, but what people had was space. Uh, so there's a lot of public space there. Um, and uh, the buildings were cheap, uh, cheaply made because uh, as long as people could live in the house, they were happy. And um, now th they, these, uh, the depth of the buildings that were produced at the time uh, was at the most uh, 10 meters. And now uh, 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 a uh, housing program that, uh, that will uh, uh, you know, stick to, to whatever is needed at the moment will be at least 15 me uh, going up to 15 meet around 15 meters in depth. And um, so you can't really just put on a new, uh, re renovate the facade or something, it just doesn't fit anymore. And um, we were asked to do a study for this area. Next. Of course, uh, first, uh, uh, the, there was a already a solution proposed by, um, uh, by um, the office that did the study. And it was a very blunt one. Uh, this shows this quality of open space. Uh, a lot of 
uh, they just turned everything into closed building blocks. So this was a very uh, modernist proposal after the Second World War, lots of open spaces. And uh, of course they did, uh, and this office did see the qualities of these open spaces and they thought, you know, we'll preserve it in a little bit, uh, <coughs> a little area of the plan. Uh, but uh, in general, you should think of just demolishing it and closing closed building blocks because that eliminates the problem of uh, who uh, uh, surveils, uh, who guards uh, the space, uh, this space, this open public space. Uh, we did a proposal for this area uh, where we tried to s uh, to show that. Also, with current uh, uh, housing programs, uh, we could uh, uh, fit, uh, do justice to the situation as it was before. So this is a proposal that completely uh, ruins uh, again, like in the proposal before, uh, the existing. Um, it really becomes fucked up. Uh, everything that used to be uh, public becomes private. So, uh, a very fairly traditional uh, situation of courts uh, is sort of reinstalled. And I think for us it was kind of really uh, frustrating. So all sort of spacious uh, aspects of the area were uh, killed. Anyways, we, we tried to reconfigure the, uh, uh, this ur urban uh, area. One of the things was that we introduce a sort of a programmatic uh, strip to uh, uh, where all sorts of activities could take place that would take care of the control of the space and uh, we did a proposal for um, uh, two blocks one was thin as they <coughs> were before as you can see just as thin as they were and one uh, was to accommodate a more contemporary housing program the uh, thin one had to be thin because it couldn't be thick and uh, for us that was an incredible relief. Uh, there was uh, an existing building that made that uh, we couldn't make a sort of a increase in depth. Um, so this one was sort of challenged as uh, sort of maybe a new uh, sort of exception to the rule uh, condition. And one of the strategies that we proposed was actually to uh, not solely build for uh, uh, or rebuild for people that uh, don't have much money, but to try uh, and by sort of re uh, or by, by sort of inserting um, very expensive apartments in an environment that we thought was had still had a lot of quality um, in order to get a different kind of mix of uh, people in an area where you wouldn't uh, expect it at first. In, in a sense it was uh, trying to reformulate uh, collectives. Um, the uh of course, you could say argue that the suburb is for the collective of the family-oriented people that uh, want a safe environment for their kids to grow up. Uh, but there are many more of these collectives, like uh, like uh, the people who just retired, uh, or um, there are many. Uh, also there are all sorts of uh, communities uh, being formed, not on the basis of having children, or maybe on the basis of having a certain lifestyle. And uh, the idea was that if you uh, uh, be specific, then you can actually uh, hook up a certain collective to a certain look of building, um, what, what enable, and that enables you to actually uh, um, make uh, this type of urban design suitable for contemporary conditions. Um, this is actually happening now, uh, happening now all over the place in the Netherlands. And this was our proposal for the thick block. Yeah, uh, the, the, the thing that we, uh, again, looked into was a sort of outdoor space. So it become became the, the, the focal point of, uh, uh, of the two designs that you'll see. Next. Uh, this is more or less a sort of a, a building block that's based on uh, fairly, uh, you know, on completely uh, conventional building technology. These are all, uh, this was not a competition proposal, this was a real commission. So we were uh, uh, asked to 
uh, come up with ideas of how to deal with this thing. And the, the thing is still hanging in the air. We might build these things. But oh, sorry. Um, well, anyways, here you see it too. There are two cores, uh, so uh, very uh, little traffic space and a lot of volume uh, organized around them. And it, you, of course, you can puzzle them together, which results in different qualities for the apartments. But the one thing that we added on to were the, is the outdoor space. Uh, the whole thing, basically, uh, as a concept, is like a hamburger with uh, Swiss cheese uh, between the layers. Uh, in this case, the, the only thing where the Swiss cheese would be interesting is the sort of uh, throughway on this uh, main uh, sort of a lane. Um, but the outdoor space is the thing that creates a visuality of the building. Right? Here's a, wi a, white, uh, a white house that has a completely organized, uh, completely focuses on the on the outdoor space in front. Right? One that is uh, high, so there's a vertically organized house next. And this one is a <coughs> sort of a rectangular deep one that turns the corner. But what's interesting about this one is that uh, seen up front, it is completely open, but what it does for the shadows is quite amazing. Uh, spectacular. And it uh, open, it has a, it has a, it looks, it has these qualities over the day and over the year, that, uh, over the whole year that completely fit what you need. It's in a sort of animated uh, wallpaper that moves over the... So the in the middle of the day you have a lot of shadows, in the, in the morning and the evening uh, it's a... Uh, the shadows more or less disappear. So Is in the summer it works as a sunblock, as you can see in these uh, uh, areas. In the winter it will sort of bring uh, the light as deep as possible into the house. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, it's in reverse, but it makes no difference. The other one is a thin one, and of course then you can't organize the building feet and deep, but you have to, uh, you know, stretch it the other way. So the, uh, the again, with completely conventional building techniques, we decided to uh, put up two walls and uh, put in between the simplest uh, uh, pre-stressed concrete plates th that we could buy that are going, uh, you know, the, go the current project in Dutch building production and put floors in between. So we would just have two low bang walls. And, and one of the bang. sort of shocking things is actually that uh, thin buildings, uh, they you cannot afford them. And uh, thick buildings you can. So um, if you want to make a thin building, it has to be really uh, exclusive to, uh, because of the sort of the proportion between the, uh, let's say the content and, uh, its and the skin, between the content and the facade. Uh, this uh, sort of ratio needs to be uh, sort of in favor of uh, the content traditionally. Yeah, to uh, so in our case, we really had to do something with the facade to make it uh, very attractive. Again, actually, actually the same type of uh, uh, infrastructure in the building, and. You can puzzle the building together again uh, because the volume is uh, open to play. Uh, but uh, by you can actually also perforate uh, the building, um, which gives everybody an outdoor space in front of their building. And since the building is east-west oriented, you have a morning sun and evening sun uh, on your terrace. And there's a oh sorry, there's a very uh, sort of. Uh don't make me go blind. Uh, <laughs> direct uh, relationship between uh, the outdoor spaces um, and the dwellings itself. So there's no, uh, let's say, construction or built material in between your uh, uh, living room and uh, your, let's say, garden, patio or loggia. A few examples of plans. Uh, this one's vertically, compact, vertically oriented. Um, all apartments in this building allow the possibility to split it in two, which uh, a lot of uh, older people in the Netherlands uh, uh, 
sort of voice uh, the, the desire to have uh, a separate apartment to their apartment, to have kids over for a while. or um, <coughs> So all, all these apartments make that possible. So multiple front doors uh, to every apartment. And this is the penthouse on top. But what is the great quality of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, these two load-bearing walls, is the fact that you can actually uh, you 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 make it in elements, and that means that uh, if you make the element the same, you can actually turn it into a completely beautiful perforated facade, which which bath uh, the whole thing in a beautiful light. All right, next. This is our first build project. Extremely, and uh, what's interesting about this project is that it also deals with the, this VNAX operation. Uh, what you see here is the, I'm sure perhaps you've heard about it before, but this is the largest single uh, continuous Phoenix extension in the Netherlands is for 35,000 houses. This is the city of Utrecht, which has about twice the surface area of this. Uh, the city center has about twice the surface area of this extension. And it means uh, that uh, about uh, 100,000 people will live and work in uh, this new area. Uh, our building was to be the first new public building in this uh, uh, city layout. This is the program, machi a machine for uh, heat, uh, uh, heat transfer. Uh, it's a heat transfer station where the uh, for city heating. So what is a point of sale for the power company to the distribution company. And that's uh, there are two loops running through the building that interact and uh, where the heat is transferred and there's a meter and it uh, you know, this is where... And one loop comes from uh, the energy production plant that um, uh, use it uses uh, uh, this water as uh, uh, cooling water. Uh, it used to be dumped because uh, uh, the, <coughs> the cooling water gets really, uh, uh, really uh, hot. The turbines get, uh, will melt if you don't cool them. Um, so... Um, uh, it's a temperature of 140 de degrees, which you can only uh, uh, create uh, or keep, maintain under uh, high pressure. So these pipes are uh, fairly expensive. Um, and sort of this loop will uh, meet the other loop that goes into the neighborhood and will uh, serve 11,000 uh, households. Um, it meets right in this pipe. Uh, what's interesting uh, about these pipes are so expensive that uh, I mean they cost about 10,000 guilders per meter to uh, put in the ground and uh, you know to to make that it didn't we never talked to our client about money which was a very comfortable situation. <laughs> so at first we didn't have a clue where the building was uh, supposed to be. We had the commission but uh, not a site. Uh, nobody wants uh, a thing this big in its uh, backyard. It's a kind of NIMBY uh, situation. Um, so we started out thinking about what kind of uh, uh, situation the building would uh, create for itself. And we thought that it would be uh, probably or very likely uh, that it would be harassed by uh, vandals. And uh, if it were built in a sort of urban situation, it would um, sort of have to protect itself against uh, vandalism. We were given a tour by the client before we had the site and they showed us all sort all their other power heat transfer stations and they were all covered in gravity. And People that made us think of out of fire to them, whatever. Yeah. Ornament and Verbrechen is a text uh, that you all know, I'm sure. And it's all about... Uh, uh, ornament, uh, 
being uh, decadent. Um, it's a very extreme text. It's a if you haven't read it yet, please do so. So, uh, ornament is to be uh, erased from uh, every building. So we thought if we can sort of uh, uh, use the hardware usually deployed to protect buildings, uh, the cobra spikes, the rotating spike combs, the glass splinters, super spikes, and barbed wire, um, if we sort of would sort of uh, intensify it, it, it might sort of turn into something sexy. So we hoped to be able to make a out of hand Herzog de Maron. <laughs> but then uh, it turned out that this was the site. Uh, <laughs> nothing urban at all. Um, this of course will change uh, in five years. It will be completely uh, different. It will be the sort of non-stop brick uh, wet dream of all project developers. <laughs> Actually, this is the exact uh, site. Here, the photographer managed to actually get the, the the chimneys of the energy plant in the same image. It's about five kilometers away. So this is the kind of artificiality that we uh, deal with. There were all kinds of uh, claims uh, on the building. So, of course, it needed to be a certain size to uh, be big enough to fit uh, the plant. Uh, but uh, all kinds of, uh, sort of forces uh, made, uh, made it that the building also should be uh, very small at the same time. So, um, for us, it was kind of uh, difficult because these two sort of uh, forces <coughs> Uh, made that we could only uh, design uh, one millimeter thick skin. Actually, the, the last two images back, there was one detail that you should notice because it became very important to us. And it's this uh, line that you see here. This is a main water duct from a water production company. And you're not allowed to build on top of that. And the, the planning office of the city, uh, uh, Leidse Rijn, uh, decided that there should be a slow traffic um, uh, uh, route to the city center. And it meant that our building will be public. It will be right in public space in a few years. Well, right now it's sitting in the back of a farm. But in seven years uh, time, this will probably uh, change mm -hmm. completely. So. Our first project and shit, no uh, architecture. Uh, there was just no space for manipulations uh, that would be spatial. And so we were left actually in a way with a millimeter thick area that we could deal with. So we tried to take that seriously and uh, found the material that was used for uh, uh, parking roofs. So. Uh, via, let's say, a back door, uh, our previous oeuvre uh, of sort of car related uh, uh, interests uh, and projects were uh, was still uh, uh, entered. Um, this is a polyurethane that can be sprayed on uh, almost anything. It looks completely toxic, uh, but isn't. It's <laughs> extremely environmentally friendly, uh, actually. These guys just want to come home clean because, uh, the, and the trick or the sort of the, the, the why this is, they wear these suits, is that they throw them away every day. But they, they spray on a harsh and a hardener, so it's an epoxy, uh, epoxy material, but there is no solvent. So uh, when uh, it's about 15 to 18 seconds after they bring the harsh and the hardener together, the, <coughs> the chemical reaction is over. Uh, if you get it on your clothes, they're out of the window. Of course, they also and don't. For us, that uh, of course was an incredible uh, potential because if it dries that fast, we might be uh, able to apply it vertically, and that would uh, allow uh, probably the first seamless building uh, in the world, a l building in a latex uh, suit. Uh, this was a proposal actually for a, a later interior that we were going to do uh, for a cinema. Uh, there was not so much money. 
and uh, so we thought, well, let's spray uh, everything that's there. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, it's kind of uh, flexible. So the, the cushion, uh, the, this pillow is still uh, sort of uh, kind of soft. So if uh, youth culture uh, would be uh, the biggest threat of the building, uh, could we um, find another way of dealing with it? Could we uh, sort of make it so attractive that uh, it becomes part of it? So we what take we the uh, youth on board. Basically. The first thing we did was actually apply a, a swoosh, sort of a Nike uh, logo, uh, on the building because that would immediately turn it. Uh, at least uh, uh, two and a half years ago into something really fashionable. Uh, <laughs> and that would be the window. But then uh, Nike promised us to uh, sue us instead of uh, uh, support us financially. Uh, uh, it was also because of course the idea was to uh, m make a buck out of it. Uh, that didn't work, but it gave us the opportunity to uh, rethink the window. And so this is the only window. <laughs> It's uh, the transparent backboard uh, of a basketball uh, basket. A, you're supposed to try and demolish it. <laughs> the only window you have to throw at. Uh, um, the project, in a way, is a sort of a public square that is uh, wrapped around uh, the box that we could hardly uh, uh, modify. So th these big doors uh, sort of have to allow uh, access. Um, this one will only open in 20 years. Uh, <laughs> it's to uh, clean the pipes uh, where the loops come together. Uh, <laughs> uh, these uh, are uh, opened on a sort of a more regular basis. And this was what happened. Um, we just sprayed it over. Um, the door uh, still sort of immaculate uh, under the skin. Um, these ones we just had to cut open, uh, which is a, a great experience. Uh, I definitely want to be there in, I think now, 18 years. Uh, <laughs> I hope they still uh, invite us to be part of that ceremony. Actually, we had a detail for the door, which was also uh, part of the uh, same uh, line of thinking. We envisioned a cup uh, on the inside with a cup where you'd have to put your hand in and to open the door. So sort of the most sort of sexy thing imaginable is to be like a vet veterinarian sort of entering uh, the building sort of up to your <laughs> shoulder and then opening it. It's the only detail that we uh, didn't manage to get uh, through. <laughs> so, all of this is actually about this thing, uh, about this little failure. But then, some things we got uh, as a present. Um, since we sprayed it over different materials, um, and they will relate in different ways to uh, temperatures and um, so they will sort of deform. At a certain day, there was a kind of X-ray visible of uh, of the underlying structure of these doors, and I was completely uh, uh, confused when I saw it because I thought it w the skin was coming off, and uh, I thought, really, oh my God, we failed. Uh, but then it was a kind of condense that uh, was sitting on the it was was morning it? thinnest uh, <laughs> uh, thinnest elements of the doors. Actually, it was kind of really attractive. The pre uh so sometimes we go play ball there, and it still feels completely uh, surreal to throw a ball at it. Another uh, wall was uh no, designated as being uh, artificial nature. It is uh, a climbing wall. Believing it, uh, believe it or not, in the Netherlands, uh, climbing is uh, the second national sport. <laughs> <laughs> but it always has to happen in uh, so completely artificial areas. We actually have two, two climbing uh, associations. <laughs> uh, 
But of course, in public space, you're not allowed to uh, build something that poses a threat or a danger to, uh, uh, you know, that, that <coughs> encourages people to do dangerous things. Um, so we were not allowed to make the climbing wall higher than two meters. Oops, this is upside down. No, the water is the water is dripping up. Uh, but. Um, of course, uh, in, uh, in climbing, there's something which is called a, a traverse, where you climb horizontally. And it seems actually to be one of the most difficult things. It seems very appropriate in the Netherlands. Horizontal yeah. climbing. So what we did was uh, apply, the <laughs> <laughs> apply the grips in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Braille pattern. So uh, actually, it spells three lines of uh, text. So. Uh, we're not going to tell what it is, but we still hope that uh, the critic that's not here tonight, uh, what's his name? Uh, he, uh, it's really a pity, but maybe he is at the moment uh, trying to figure out what, uh, what it actually says. Black is beautiful. And yeah, black is not black, uh. also. I think we're... Uh, next slide. Next probably. Slide. The south, uh, south facade has the biggest water spout in the Netherlands. The only Actually, the, the only area where some manipulations of the uh, volume were uh, imaginable was uh, on the south side because uh, there were the toilets uh, located and some transform transformators or whatever they call and they needed not all the headroom of the installation itself so the toilet is situated right under the stupid hole since uh, it rains 134 days uh, a year in the Netherlands. Um, we hope to be able to change around this sort of negative experience into a positive one. There's a number of uh, prefabricated uh, German brand uh, bird houses um, accommodated uh, in the skin. So we hope they use this as sort of a flying route or way home. <laughs> on the other, uh, on the southwest corner of the building, actually there are uh, uh, also a few uh, holes in the facade. And uh, in the Netherlands, it's you know one of the uh, don'ts in urban design is you're not allowed to make uh, places where the youth can hang out. So uh, we, since we wanted to accommodate uh, youth culture, uh, we uh, made some holes in the in the facade where bats can hang. So of course, it was incredibly frustrating to do your first building uh, that is not uh, inhabited. So we needed some uh, some life in this uh, project. So we have the uh, went too fast. we have the apus apus, as it's called in uh, Latin. It's a particular kind of swift that uh, in uh, all new expansions in the Netherlands find it very difficult to uh, find housing. So it's a kind of domesticated uh, bird. A bird that um, uh, was uh, very uh, fr frequently uh, seen, but uh, with new building techniques, find it fairly difficult to find uh, a nesting area. So we hope that it will be able to uh, find the holes that we uh, made up here, right in the corniche. Uh, if you would do it lo uh, lower, uh, these birds that uh, fly about three qu uh, quarter of the year uh, non-stop, uh, so they even uh, sleep uh, while flying. Um, they have the habit to uh, leave the nest uh, by jumping out and uh, um, 
using uh, the height uh, to, uh, to to gain some speed. So <laughs> if they uh, if you would make a nesting box for this particular kind of bird, it would uh, at let's say four meters height, <laughs> it would uh, drop that and would not be able uh <laughs> to <laughs> to fly again. <laughs> and the other thing is, <laughs> it's really uh, amazing. The the bird has a, a kind of a, a approach that makes that uh, as soon as it enters the nesting box, it goes uh, left immediately. So the nesting box has a hole that is uh, asymmetrically uh, positioned. Because if you uh, sort of put them the wrong way around, <laughs> they will always hit their heads against <laughs> the wall. <laughs> the roadside reflector that you saw a little bit earlier um, is under the skin as well. So um, There's a regular grid that uh, of which uh, some, of, uh, some of the reflectors sort of pop through. It's the probably the most decadent thing you can do is uh, this incredibly beautiful element is also sprayed over. Uh, <laughs> there was a German artist that, uh, uh, or jewelry maker that uh, made this uh, black rubber uh, uh, bracelet with a golden uh, little bowl in it, so you could not see uh, the gold. It was in the rubber. Um, it feels very uh, similar. At a certain point in time he even made uh, this uh, golden bowl that would fit under your armpit. So you could not shake hands uh, at openings. So some of them actually pop through the skin and spell the name of the building. So since we could get rid of any architectural uh, detailing, uh, let's say the traditional meeting points of materials were uh, not there anymore, we could just let the water drip off. This is the uh, contemporary ideal of uh, a landscape, but soon to be replaced. This whole area will be uh, filled up soon with a new ideal uh, of suburban housing. Uh, well while doing this project, <laughs> we <laughs> we had to make this uh, stupid hole, um, sort of reclaiming uh, the sort of this sort of flimsy domain of this one millimeter of skin uh, that we uh, could only uh, manipulate. Um, so the hole for us was incredibly important because it sort of created a kind of massiveness that was, uh, in a way, unprecedented. Uh, but to make it, we uh, had to use this uh, uh, translucent pipe. And when we saw it, we were so uh, stunned that uh, we almost uh, uh, changed around the concept. Uh, but then uh, later on, we decided to turn it into uh, a one-to-one -one scale model uh, of our next uh, project. We were asked to do this project uh, in uh, the ci city in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, also because a uh, heat transfer uh, commission uh, for a project for city heating. But uh, it's called a, a, a auxiliary boiler house. And uh, a, few year, a few weeks a year, uh, it's too cold for the, uh, for the, the general installation to... Uh, heat all the houses that are hooked up. So um, they have auxiliary units kicking in. And, um, but they do have uh, openings. The other building is only for transfer, heat transfer. This one actually uh, has uh, gas boilers and it needs uh, chimneys, safety valves, air intakes and lighting and also access. And that meant that we had to perforate the building. And we use this as a point of departure. 
after our discovery from the previous project. So all the poked out uh, uh, mass sort of reappears uh, on top of the building uh, as chimneys and inlets. And Inside the bulls when it was not sprayed over yet. Continuing the hole. This is a ceramics project that we were uh, asked to do by a firm that's called Core Unum. Um, they're top league uh, ceramics firm. And they asked us to design a, uh, a container of 30 by 30 by 35 centimeters. Um, what came out is, uh, in our case, uh, three archetypical phases uh, that can contain uh, any shape of a bouquet uh, merged together. And this is the. So in every position, it just contains enough water to uh, support uh, the bouquet for a day. Of course, there's uh, one other position available if you can't choose. You put it on three sides and three, uh, three open sides stick up. And this is uh, a project for Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a competition that was won by Don Bates. And it's called Return to the Fold. And it was done after Michael Speak just de declared the fold dead. As a formal manipulation, uh, we uh, tried to prove him wrong. Uh, as a pr uh, that it al could also be uh, a literal uh, uh, manipulation. Melbourne is uh, the capital of uh, Victoria, the Garden State, and uh, uh, Melbourne claims to have four seasons a day. So it's a weird climate. You have burning burn time, and you have rain. And um, but the fall, uh, of course, you all know the definition. Uh, the other part interests us a lot. A return to a religious body of believers. The site. I'm sure that probably Don gave a lecture here, and you see, you've seen it before. But uh, again, here's the uh, extension to the existing city square over the railroad tracks, some of them that were uh, to be preserved. For um, but the idea was to connect the existing city uh, center to the, si uh, to the river. Um, it was also one of the first times uh, uh, since the Second World War that, uh, the uh, that there was a public commissioned uh, building done in Melbourne. Um, there are four areas, that uh, the garden precinct, a beautiful park, the entertainment uh, uh, and arts precinct, where uh, all leisure activities, indoor leisure activities, hotels, gambling take place, <coughs> sports, and a business uh, district. People make money and shop. Um, and uh, they were to be connected by this project. Uh, what's interested us uh, was the idea that um, uh, that we were there was a brief for a competition, and uh, the city of Melbourne wanted a mo monument uh, for the for this uh, uh, place. Um, but uh, what they gave us was a totally. Uh, uh, weird mix of program, which contain, uh, what w is a weird mix, but what is actually a very uh, contemporary mix, uh, with uh, uh, everything v uh, v uh, varying from um, like uh, snack bars and, uh, and uh, coffee shops, uh, not in the Dutch sense, but in the normal sense, to uh, um, uh, theater spaces, theater uh, spaces movies. cinemas. <laughs> And, uh, All kinds of cultural, uh, high, 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 high culture and low culture sort of uh, fused together in a 
non-hierarchical uh, way, which seemed to be very uh, appealing and very contemporary. Next. One of the things that struck us was uh, the preliminary sketches that they send in uh, for us as a basis to work on is that they sort of totally messed up and frustrated and fucked the incredibly beautiful uh, integrity of the, the contour of this uh, grid city. Um, what we w wanted to do is uh, sort of maintain that. Um, the, exist, uh, the, the existing railroad tracks uh, uh, took up this entire area. This area became available, but we were to bridge the remaining railroad tracks uh, in order to get to the river. So the first thing uh, we did was uh, lay a foundation of uh, parking garages, which would be the sort of uh, uh, the, <coughs> the bridge heads for the uh, building on top. We made a kind of hollow park. Um that would connect uh, the both uh, areas of the city, and in, in that hollow uh, slope, you would find the parking. The building would sit on top of it. Um, what you see here is something that we'll talk about a little later. But we also uh, redesigned the infrastructure that lead the, the sort of new exit uh, to the central business district. Um, this is the sort of program horizontally laid out. Uh, which Completely is flat diagram. What's interesting is that basically it makes up a mall. Uh, it's a, a mall uh, by the this sort of a public, uh, semi public space or a privately policed space uh, with all sorts of different uh, shops and uh, programs in it. Uh, and this uh, is a space in between, something that we, w we call the browsing space. Uh, but what, what is problematic about this is, is that it's discriminatory in nature. There is something which is public space, um, where of course everybody has access. But this is uh, basically, uh, you have to be, uh, um, you know, you have to uh, uh, fulfill certain standards. Either you have a credit card or uh, you look presentable uh, to enter this space. Uh, but this, uh, we wanted to see if this uh, could be turned into something that uh, that would uh, see if there are, if, if this could all, if dealing with this contemporary program we could also make new um, uh, combinations possible of public space and this uh, uh, privately uh, uh, maintained space. So we made a square on top of the tracks and we folded it up. So by, by putting the, the square on top of the shopping mall, <coughs> the hypothesis was that every sort of single uh, element of the program uh, could be reachable um, right from the public domain. So there was a shortcut and you didn't need to uh, take this maybe claustrophobic uh, collective space uh, in between, this sort of glue uh, in between the different elements of the program. So we open up the choice for each program to decide whether or not uh, to hook up to public space. building seen from top. Um, many programs laid out. There's a this uh, this area hooks up to the uh, to the to the station that's here, uh, and all because uh, um, slants down to the street. Next. So by making the building as uh, thin as we did, uh, let let's say making it one story. Uh, thick, um, the central business district uh, could sort of still remain itself in a way. Access. Some points uh, we dig into the program and the public space uh, connects directly to the uh, programs inside. Here's a situation where we uh, uh, 
let in a, a private uh, or a basketball court into a supermarket. Right. You can imagine that people pushing their carts uh, stand in front of big sweaty men. The public, this uh, browsing space now also becomes uh, 3D. Uh, it's a 3D browsing space. The Winter Garden uh, Hub was kind of a central uh, element uh, to the program. So um, we combined the the the, 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 the spaces for greenery uh, with the browsing space. That would become one. But the whole thing also became some sort of an uh, informal Arc de Triomphe uh, from seen from the city grid. So it's an outdoor atrium, a new uh, typology sheltering from the rain, the burn time. The central question was uh, to redefine uh, the atrium and uh, atriums, of course, always have a, a kind of uh, interface. Um, there's always a kind of glass barrier that you have to go through uh, with um, sort of steel uh, X-ray devices that will uh, see if you carry any guns or whatever. So uh, this is probably the first real public atrium uh, available for you next week. Three D browsing space also needs a three D access, readily available. Seen from the park on the other side, uh, presenting the building as a logo. Here's the. Um, this infrastructure that I just mentioned. Um, yeah, we call it the Batman, the Batman Returns Parade. Uh, it's the, the idea is that building is not, uh, has, is not only a, uh, an object, uh, sort of a functional object, uh, that infrastructure can also be uh, something that is uh, meant to entertain and to, uh, uh, to give you pleasure. Uh, you approach, uh, the uh, the city center f from this way, with a view of the uh, this new monument standing up for the city. Then you turn and, and f over your windshield, uh, uh, first thing you you then see is uh, the the sort of the playful towers of the uh, arts and uh, leisure district. Before you dive into the canyons of the Central Business District. Here's also sort of a uh, sort of thickening it's of the infrastructure. Of investigation in what could happen if, uh, for instance, Disney would go not just into, let's say, urbanism or housing, but what would happen if Disney would uh, <laughs> design a highway? Maybe this could be uh, the result. <laughs> this is uh, the Millennium Bridge. The New Tate and St. Paul's uh, Cathedral. Uh, was, uh, we also looked at this competition for uh, uh, this little thin line, this tourist trap. You drop them off here, they enjoy a little bit of modern art, they go across uh, to enjoy some uh, more traditional uh, beauty and then are picked up again and shipped off to Paris. Um, we yeah, the competition uh, brief contained uh, uh, actually of a completely clear, clearly defined uh, uh, outline for the dimensions of uh, that bridge. Uh, <laughs> what we did was uh, plainly uh, sort of extruded and then uh, manipulated into uh, sort of 3D uh, effects. Um, why a thin bridge if you also could have a square? The only thing asked was basically, I think, uh, the detailing of that section. And I think beforehand it was already clear who was going to do it. Um, one of the discoveries uh, was that 
um, the Thames was actually a tidal river. Um, so if this would be low tide, um, the high tide would uh, deform uh, the surface. I think this is a, so one final uh, quick uh, thing to end the lecture. Uh, one of our first uh, built works. It's a collection of jewelry. <laughs> Perfectly sort of extends into uh, Fena's uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, it was used in an exhibition uh, called 9 plus 1, which should have call been called uh, 11 minus 1 because there's an office called One Architecture and they were not part of the exhibition. Um, we were asked uh, to uh, fill a transparent uh, box in an inflatable with a model, but we did everything by a computer at the time and couldn't afford any uh, models to be made. Um, then the only thing we had was, this, was these rings. So We put them on display in you know, a kind of incubator uh, way to sort of <laughs> emphasize the experience of uh, sort of <laughs> looking, but also uh, the aspect of touching it and sort of fitting it on became uh, part of the First place uh, display the window, window display. First place uh, proposal. The, uh, the, the rings, uh, the 9 plus 1 exhibition travel to was uh, Sao Paulo. In, in Brazil and uh, of course there was an insurance on the rings and um, you know the whole idea is uh, about uh, the, the concept is about uh, you know uh, not being able to actually being able to touch your object of the desire but not being able to appropriate it the rings were stolen immediately <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, from the insurance uh, money, we survived another year. <laughs> <laughs> they were heavily overinsured. My feeling is that this is the last uh, image. In a way, I hope it is. <laughs> We uh, deliberately didn't show many new things. Uh, that's actually uh, because we want to be uh, back maybe with uh, some new stuff because we actually have a lot of new slides. Do you guys take any questions? Of course. Okay. If anybody has any questions, <coughs> a microphone maybe. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm waking up. I see another one. Where is it? I'm missing it. Hmm. No questions, huh? Okay. I have a question. Why do you go out on Thursday night? Thank you very much, Mark Linneman and Camille Klaas from NL Architects. Thank you.